Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Master of Architecture uh, session of the Open House. Um, my name is Mario Gooden. I am the interim director uh, of the Master of Architecture program, and I'm really delighted to, uh, to welcome you here and to invite you um, to become a part of the GSAP community. Um, I know that you just came from hearing uh, Dean Andreas Yake, um, so I, won't, I will try not to repeat too much of what he said, although I noticed that Andreas did steal some of my slides. <laughs> so. um, but as the Dean was saying, our planet is going through enormous uh, environmental, social, and technological changes, and they manifest across, uh, across scales in the ways in which bodies, space, ecologies, politics, and aesthetics intersect and are entangled. These intersections are the terrain in which the various disciplines at our school operate. And this is why um, what we do here is so important and now more than ever. Um, GSAP has always been at the forefront of leading change in our discipline, uh, beginning with the first paperless studios in uh, architectural education that occurred right here in Avery Hall 30 years ago. And uh, Andreas showed this animation, but actually I have a little bit more that he did not show. Um, and this really began the digital evolution in architectural design. That change and the change that's needed now uh, is critical and must be both um, radically experimental and politically engaged. Um, this is what our school excels at. This is what um, we stand for and what we all work for together. So, um, Hopefully, uh, if you haven't had a chance to visit the, the studios during your tours this morning, um, you will get up there um, this afternoon, um, as well as visit some of the reviews. Um, but here you see uh, our studios on the sixth floor. Uh, you see here Avery Library. Um, and uh, you know we like to think of the, the architecture school as being uh, on the foundation, if you will, of, of Avery Library. Um, this building, Avery Hall, was designed by McKim Mead and White um, and constructed in 1912. However, the architecture program dates back to 1861. Um, and this archive has been really important um, to the education at Avery here, but um, this is not a dead archive. Um, as you can, uh, as you will see, um, Avery is a living archive. It is um, also the place in which we continue to question what's in the archive, what's not in the archive, and how do we, you know, above it, if you will, continue to construct new knowledge that adds to, uh, to that archive. Also, how do we work uh, interdisciplinarily with, with a trans-scalar approach to the built environment? Um, our school develops new forms of pedagogy, research, and practice to address the crucial and urgent issues that we face. Uh, this approach is centered you know, around uh, the tenets that the Dean spoke of uh, earlier today, uh, those tenets such as uh, climate paradigms, decolon decolonization, uh, practices of mutual care, um, rethinking uh, the city, and, uh, and regrounding our fields. Um, and so here, in, in Avery, um, and not just Avery, but down on the, uh, here we are on the, the middle there where you see the cursor um, in uh, Wood Auditorium, but you see that the MARC program and the architecture programs actually sort of seep out into the campus underneath, uh, underneath the campus. Um, and all of this is part of the pedagogy of learning in terms of these spaces, including the maker space, which hopefully you will as well have an opportunity uh, to visit. So if we think of our studios, we think of the library, we think of the maker space as being uh, important pillars, if you will, in terms of our, uh, in terms of our architectural education. And so it's not, you know, although Columbia uh, I think has a reputation in terms of computation, certainly, uh, but that computation is also uh, grounded in materiality and uh, the materiality of the materiality of space and the materiality of design. Um, along these lines, uh, again, what sets uh, our program apart, the Masters of Architecture program apart, 
at Columbia, I think, from other programs. Um, some of you, I'm sure, might be visiting some of our sister schools, but I would say what sets us apart is that architecture is not a priori. Um, architecture is not a given, it's not an assumption. So we continually ask um, the question about what is architecture. We do not assume to know what architecture is, and I think that um, at Columbia, architectural is an int intellectual and theoretical question uh, and a question of discursive practice. Um, in the source of self-regard, selected essays, speeches, and meditations, the writer Tony Morrison states, my effort to manipulate American English was not to take standard English uh, and use the vernacular to decorate it or to paint over it, but to carve away at its accretions of deceit, blindness, ignorance, paralysis, and sheer malevolence, so that certain kinds of perceptions were not only available, but were inevitable. Likewise, I would say our program seeks to carve away and question the disciplinary boundaries of architecture so that certain kinds of perceptions and representations that have always existed are given presence. I mean, here you're seeing a little bit more of, I think the dean went by this pretty quickly. This was the, uh, the pavilion that was uh, constructed this past semester or last semester, last spring, by professors Laurie Hawkinson and Galia Solomonov's uh, studio, which was a response uh, to a prompt uh, called Deep Time, and it was an all-school charrette that happened at the beginning of, of last semester. Um, hence, our program uh, for the longest time has sought to engage an idea about radical uh, pedagogy, um, and that is you know, in terms of thinking about climate, in terms of thinking about equity, in terms of thinking about data and design. And we've been on the, I would say, on the leading uh, or on the forefront in terms of these issues. So maybe we'll just quickly take a look at our, at the Masters of Architecture curriculum to get you a bit more familiar with it. Um, so at the at present moment, um, I would say, you know, with regards to this question about architecture, um, it is a question also of uncertainty. Um, again, we don't presume to know what architecture is, but to uh, ask questions about what can arch architecture be or what if, if you will, what if architecture. I think that was the old Hewlett Packard commercial, oh. what if, All right? Um, and so our curriculum is constructed around uh, these strands, the design studios, uh, building science and technology, uh, visual studies, history and theory, professional practice, and then our electives. Um, and you will hear more from the faculty that are here today uh, about each one of these uh, strands in a few minutes. Um, but the first part of our curriculum, uh, and as you know, it's a three-year curriculum. The first part is called the, the core, and these are the first three semesters. Um, so this is first year and the first semester of third year um, with a variety, a, a number of studios to take um, that you see in, uh, uh, in the top line in, in blue and in typical um, in first and second year, we have about eight or so studios of 10 to 12 students each. Then we have re required courses in terms of our history theory and in terms of visual studies and building technology and uh, or building science and technology. The final three semesters are what we call our advanced studios, starting with advanced studio four and then five and then six. And these are, uh, are really our option studios in which you would have a chance to work with um, a diverse group of faculty who are really bringing a diverse, let's, let's say, set of expertise um, in these final three semesters. Um, but across the curriculum is the opportunity for you actually to construct your own path, um, to really sort of think about what is your trajectory in terms of uh, in terms of the discipline of architecture and in terms of the profession of architecture. So beginning with our technology sequence, and um, I am just going to go through a few slides to give you some examples of each of these very quickly so that actually you can engage the faculty in terms of questions and, and answers. Um, but our uh, technology sequence is constructed around these four stones, if you will, equity and health, design uh, and building, climate and energy, and high tech and low tech. And again, you see the distribution in terms of you know, first year, second year, and third year in terms of our 
required tech courses and our tech electives. Um, in, in the spring, we held something called the Tech Shop, which is a series of, of talks, um, which happened. Um, but our building science and technology is also engaged in thinking about new materials and experimenting with new materials. Uh, our coordinator of the building science and technology sequence, Professor Lola Benalan, is also um, the director of the Natural Materials Lab. So those of you who are interested in thinking about new materials, thinking about um, zero carbon buildings, thinking about those possibilities. Um, but our tech sequence is also not simply engaged in terms of the, the object and its materiality, but thinking about the object in terms of its scale with the city and with the environment. Uh, our tech sequence also uh, intersects with other parts of the curriculum, particularly uh, visual studies and what we call viz tech. And here you're seeing some examples. Um, and uh, not only viz tech, but also deep into computation um, with regards to viz tech. And of course, visual studies. Uh, Professor Laura Kurgan is the coordinator of the visual studies sequence and also the director of the new, the youngest program, <laughs> computational design practices. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, it was about 30 years or so when Columbia introduced the first paperless studios, which really began, let's say, I would say an, a revolution, not only in terms of architectural education, but also in terms of the profession. Um, and, uh, and our program has continued, I would say, to be at the, the forefront of computation in terms of design. You know, and a series of uh, extraordinary uh, architectural uh, representation courses, drawing courses, modeling courses, uh, courses on reputation, but also thinking about the inventions uh, of drawing, if you will. And then our history theory uh, sequence coordinated by Professor Reinhold Martin. Um, Professor Martin, and I don't think I really call him this, but Professor Martin. <laughs> um, uh, who also uh, not only teaches history theory, um, but you will also run into uh, to Reinhold on design juries uh, from time to time and uh, maybe even teaching a studio. I'm putting a plug in already, Reinhold. But on the, let's say, the, uh, the topic of sort of equity and decolonization that the dean was speaking, speaking of, um, it was uh, a number of years ago, actually before 2020, um, that the Race and Modern Architecture Project was launched at Columbia. I think it was in 2014 or 2015 by yeah. Professor uh, Mabel Wilson which then culminated in the Race and Modern Architecture book. Um, we have the Detlef Mertens uh, lecture series and uh, Professor Atiyah uh, Korakawiela uh, is here today who will also be here to answer questions. Uh, I mentioned Professor Laura Kurgan um, and I should also mention Laura is the director of the Center for Spatial Research. And uh, the uh, MARC program is highly is uh, also quite um, coordinated and related to what happens in our Buell Center, the Buell Center uh, for American Architecture, and the direction of Professor Lucia Ale. And I think I would be remiss not to add um, Columbia Books on Architecture in the City as a sort of as a leading uh, sort of imprint of Columbia University Press, um, and the. Uh, I think perhaps maybe 20 or so years ago, uh, we all thought that books were going to go away, but actually books have become much more important. And we continue to, to think about our work and to continue to think about how it is that we put out new knowledge in, into the world, particularly using the arm of, uh, of Columbia Books on architecture in the city. Uh, the uh, fourth strand that you saw was the professional practice strand uh, and our a uh, revamped professional practice course called Just Practice. Um, we also have a, a 
uh, symposium called Constructing Practice, uh, which will be happening again next spring. Uh, but professional practice is not something which is siloed. It actually occurs across all six semesters um, in some explicit ways and also in some implicit ways in our program. And of course, that is directly related to, um, to career services um, and what, uh, what you can expect after graduating with your professional degree here from Columbia. As the Dean mentioned, some of you may be uh, uh, candidates for a, a dual degree and enrolling in uh, uh, more than one program. And we also have a number of interdisciplinary courses that also cut across, uh, cut across programs, um, such as our uh, Planning and Cultural Space course, Immeasurable Cities, led by Emmanuel Admasu, who's also lecturing uh, this evening. And I hope that you can stick around for Emmanuel's presentation. And then the MRC students also uh, participants in our summer workshops. Um, these were on hiatus, of course, uh, during, uh, during COVID, uh, but returned this past summer, um, which gives our students or gives you an opportunity to study with a particular faculty for two to four weeks during the, uh, during the summers. And uh, these workshops are engaged in work um, in places like Puerto Rico or through the Global Africa Lab uh, on the continent of, of Africa, or here you see an example of the uh, uh, virtual reality workshop led by Professor Vanessa Keith uh, this summer. Um, but also, again, having the opportunity to work across programs. So a summer workshop called the, uh, An Atlas of Dust, led by the director of the Masters uh, of Historic Preservation Program, uh, Professor Jorge Otero Palos. And so for the design studios, Going back to that top strand, um, some examples from our, you know, from first year. Um, and I, again, I, I don't think I can overemphasize the notion that architecture is a, is a question. Um, so even for those of you who may have come from an architecture background, um, I think that you can expect uh, that you're not, you will not just be doing what you've done or what you did in your undergraduate uh, education um, but that you will be in for something that's really um, uh, challenging, fresh, but also provocative in, in terms of asking you to, to really reconsider um, perhaps what you think you know about architecture and to think about what architecture can actually, uh, what the possibilities of architecture are. And these are just some examples from, uh, from the fall of 2021's uh, core one uh, last spring in terms of core two and the introduction uh, in terms of experimentation with materiality and new materials uh, through thinking uh, uh, and rethinking, if you will, architectural uh, typologies. And I would say that uh, for at least 40 years or so, uh, the housing studio at Columbia um, has been <clears throat> um, a, a place in which um, we've really studied housing and have, have also been on the, on the, let's say, leading edge in terms of thinking about housing, thinking about housing in urban environments, thinking about housing across the boroughs, across uh, working in New York City in various sites and in various contexts. And some examples of the uh, core three, which is the housing studio uh, coordinated by Professor Hillary Sample from fall of 2021. And then our advanced studios, beginning with uh, advanced studio four. This is from Professor Nina Cook John's studio. Um, uh, the advanced four studio tends to work, let's say, in uh, larger scales of environments or territories, if you will. Uh, this studio was working uh, in the Hudson Valley. Uh, Professor Zia uh, Jamaladeen uh, was working uh, in the Delaware River uh, watershed uh, at the uh, near where Pennsylvania and, uh, and New York, New York State kind of uh, interlock. Uh, 
a studio led by Professor Na Yun Wang. Uh, and then in Advance 5, and I think uh, Ninyake also had one or two of these images, but this is Bernard Shumi's uh, island studio from fall of 2021. Uh, situated in the in the Hudson River, uh, this a studio called Ex Extreme Scales by Professor Laurie Hawkinson, which looked at um, let's see if I can go back here. What you're seeing is a cross section of the BQE, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, and this studio um, looks at what happens once uh, the Brooklyn uh, Queens Expressway. Uh, what happens when that piece of infrastructure uh, is no longer usable and how can that space be appropriated? Uh, and this studio, again, was called Extreme Scales. To Professor Mabel Wilson's studio called Post Plantation Futures. Professor Michael Bell's studio, which was called The Removal of Motion. Professor Mimi Wong's studio, uh, a factory as it might be. And uh, we were really pleased to sort of be back uh, this last year, sort of, you know, fully making models again in person. Um, and again, here you can see, you know, how crucial models are also to our, to our investigations. David Benjamin's studio called Climate Architecture and Uncertainty, Risk, Climate Architecture and Uncertainty. Uh, Professor Mark Rasuda's studio called Detox USA. Emmanuel Edmasu's studio called After Images on Restitution, An Animism, and Diaspora. The Maker Graph studio uh, led by Aratola and Giuseppe Lignano. And uh, our program has also returned to, uh, to traveling uh, during what we call our Kinney Week, which happens in the spring for the advanced studios, um, where our studios travel uh, nationally and internationally for their uh, studio site visits. And these are from this past spring. Finally, uh, your individual trajectories um, in the MARC program is the construction of an individual thesis of, or arguments, if you will. We actually do not have a formal thesis project, but I would say that your, the portfolio, your graduation portfolio uh, weave, that weaves together your design, your writing, your drawing, and your making is a kind of thesis, if you will, or, or final argument. Um, this is the portfolio that you will submit at the end of your time here, the end of your, your three years as a requirement for graduation and honors. Um, additionally, um, your work comes together um, at our end of the year show, um, and we relaunched the end of the year show this past, uh, this past year, this past spring. Um, and it, it, and uh, as in the past, the end of the year show takes over the entirety of Avery Hall, um, as well as existing online. But this is an opportunity, one of the other opportunities among many others actually, uh, to share your work with others, with your classmates, um, but also to get a, a really good sense of the work that's going on in the school at the end of the year. So again, I'm really happy to, uh, to welcome each of you here and um, looking forward to, uh, to reading your applications <laughs> later. Um, but right now I wanna turn it over to, uh, to the faculty and invite the faculty to come up um, and uh, we can open up the discussion uh, with your questions. Uh, so let's see, we have Professor Laura Kurgan, Professor Reinhold Martin, uh, Zia Jamaladeen, Michael Bell, Amina Blackshear, Lola Benalan, oh there you are Lola, uh, Mimi Wong, Atia uh, Korakilawa, and Professor Mark Suramaki. If you will just introduce yourselves, maybe say you know just a few things about what you've been teaching, and uh, we'll do that with everyone, and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, so uh, my name is Mark Suramaki, and I teach in the advanced studio sequence 
uh, typically doing the Advanced 5 studios in the fall. As currently, I also teach a seminar in the spring in the visual studies sequence on the topic of section as a representational mechanism and a spatial operation. Um, I am a principal of LTL Architects uh, practice here in the city uh, that conducts a combination of both um, uh, public institutional cultural work, but also uh, independent research um, projects that we take on within the office. Uh, the most recent of which is a new publication coming out later this fall called uh, Manual of Biogenic Sections, uh, follow up to a previous publication called Manual of Section that looks at uh, low carbon uh, and uh, carbon sequestering materials. It's a long list here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Michael Bell, a professor of architecture. Um, I, Mario did such a great job of speaking about the scope of the school. Most of us here have touched various parts of that scope, so that was wonderful to see. Um, I teach design studios, a, a history theory seminar. I was previously the director of the core studio, so I have a, a real sense of that. But I, I would just, be, to be very brief, um, and really you can look at the bios online, I remember being where you are, and uh, very vividly for me, it was actually quite a few years ago, but that possibility of engaging at a school and imagining what the school is, according to its own record versus what you're gonna make it. And architecture schools are really in the process of constantly being remade. So I feel like Mario did a beautiful job of trying to describe that ambition. All of us here, I think you'll see if you read our bios on the website, you'll get a sense of the scope. Most of us are design, many of us are doing multiple things from designing to writing. Some of us are obviously more truly in the scholarly realm, some are more in the practice realm. But one thing about Columbia, I would say, and I think most of us is that we frequently merge those kind of scenarios where we write, we read history theory, we try to design. So I think you'll see that quality as we go through. Thank you. Hi, welcome everyone. I'm Mimi Huang. I am currently teaching Core 3, which is the housing studio. And um, I have taught the um, Advanced 6 and the Summer AAD, and I used to coordinate Core 2. And no matter what I teach, I'm just obsessed with architecture integrated into landscape ecologies. Welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Amina Blackshire. I teach the Core 1, Core 2, and have taught Advanced 4. Uh, I have a practice called Atelier Amina that looks at bringing analog to digital um, interfaces productively together. Um, what I find most exciting about um, the entry, uh, whether you have a background or not, is it, it's a really productive interchange between all of these different uh, origins. So in core one, we really dive into bringing an idea into substance. And so it's amazing to see the range. I think uh, Columbia is uh, the place that you wanna come if you wanna experiment, uh, explore uh, creativity, break out of kind of formulaic ways of approaching things, so we do that uh, almost from every angle. So welcome. Hi everyone, I'm Laura Kurgan. So as you can see up there, I wear a lot of um, different hats over here, but um, we're talking about the architecture program. And from that point of view, I always like to underscore um, three things which really bring together a lot of the work that I do. Um, and the one is that architects don't build things. They don't physically build things. They draw things. They model things. They design things. They imagine things into the future. Um, and second is that the tools that architects use aren't neutral in that process, and they create the world in which um, they're actually created within. The tools are created within, and they have a very big impact on the way that we think and imagine space. And so I often, you know, try and get my students to get, be very aware of how they do what they do and the processes involved in, um, in architectural thinking. Um, and then the third is that space is coded. So we think of, you know, code as something out there that computer scientists do. But I think space, the way we're sitting here, you know, how many people come and sit in the front row, um, the fact that we know how to sit in rows in this building, everything, every space that we're in is coded socially and politically and physically and also digitally and how those things all 
come together. So I teach a, a seminar, Conflict Urbanism, where we all produce a public-facing website, and then I also teach um, advanced studios. Hi, hi, uh, you guys. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Reinhold Martin. I, as you heard from Mario, I direct or coordinate the history and theory sequence in that, I, don't, I forget what color we were, like one of the bands uh, in, the, in the curriculum, MR curriculum. I'll just give you, just, just because I'm sure you have questions, but a, a little more detail on that. Um, the, the entry course in the first year is called Questions in Architectural History, one in the fall and two in the spring. And uh, I and Atia and uh, Mabel Wilson and Lucia, a whole group of faculty, all of whom are full-time, either tenured or tenure-track faculty in the school, teach in the first year. And, and we've made a point of that because we consider our responsibility is to introduce, pedagogically, is to, in to introduce you or, and or your colleagues and, and predecessors um, to, to the kind of questions um, that historically have shaped uh, the field uh, that you're entering. So, so that takes place. And, and then there are elective courses after that. But it's very important that there's a kind of foundation course that is not built on, you know, out of concrete, but more, I mean, to echo Mario's emphasis on questions, you know, on, on sand. Um, but it's real sand. That's for Lola, that's for Lola. <laughs> that's my transition. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Lola Benalon, and welcome to the open house. So nice to see everyone. And I direct the building tech sequence, and I also direct the natural materials lab, which some of you had the chance to visit um, and tour this morning. And at the building tech sequence, we really focus on building technologies um, beyond maybe instruments or tools that are used for um, climatic and societal urgencies, but as agents that are perhaps sometimes um, unpredictable, uh, speculative, sometimes also disobedient, um, um, as you know, uh, beyond tools of architectural design. And um, a lot of the focus um, we are bringing to the TIC sequence looks at decarbonization of existing buildings and materialities of care and health. Um, and with that, I teach the first and the last core required courses at the TIC sequence. The first is on environments in uh, architecture and TIC 5, which is the last core course, is uh, really focused on construction and life cycle systems in architecture. And I'm happy to answer any questions about the sequence or the lab. Hi, everyone. Welcome. And uh, my name is Atiya Karakiwala. I teach in the, in the history theory sequence in the MR uh, program. I um, thought I'd tell you a little bit more about uh, this, our course that Reinhold just spoke about a little bit, questions in architectural history. I teach in the spring semester. That's QAH2. Um, you know, you would learn the lingo very fast <laughs> of, 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 you know, we, so I'm one of three instructors who teaches this course and it really focuses on questions and ideas that have animated um, thinking across the 20th and architectural thinking across the 20th century. Um, this course tries to think the history of architectural modernity um, you know, as a contested and culturally uncertain category. And so in that way, you know, it really dovetails into this idea of uncertainty that uh, Mario brought up that it really runs through um, the, the curriculum. Um, we, uh, you know, it's, I, it is my firm conviction, I, I will say, that just as we are all modern, uh, that modernity is a global phenomenon it, in the same way we're all post-colonial. And so one of the things I try to do in this course is bring this post-colonial critique to the history of 20th century architecture. So outside of QAH2, I also teach um, some of the electives in the history theory sequence. And I'll tell you a little bit about them. One of them is called architecture and development. Another one is called architecture and infrastructure. And the third one is called um, feasting and fasting. And 
some of them, uh, you know, so I'll tell you some of the questions that we address in these. So seminars have this very intimate environment. You know, it's a small group of students. We really uh, have the capacity to discuss with each other and learn to think out loud and really learn to um, develop critical capacity in these spaces. And so to give you this example um, of my class, Feasting and Fasting, you know, we really try and address questions of taste, um, aesthetic, gustatory, and how they shape networks of empire. So this kind of, um, this kind of history theory work ranges from the scale of the intimate to the scale of the planetary. And so I hopefully will be able to, um, will have been able to give you a a taste of you know history theory and I look forward to your questions. Hello everyone my name is Yad Jamal Dean. I'm an architect a partner at Left Architect based here in New York and Beirut with a research and a work that is focused maybe on engaging religious and cultural institutions. I also teach and coordinate Advanced Studio 4 which looks at the kind of regional scale of upstate New York with a focus on the rurality or rural area as a site of investigations in the spring, that's uh, second year, second semester um, art program. In the fall, I teach in Advanced Studio 5, which has been looking the last few years at, uh, let's say, unpacking or revisiting colonial and indigenous architecture in North Africa, with a focus on Tunisia as a place. And uh, the, lastly, I do a seminar titled Building Islam, which kind of critically look at the historiography of Islamic architecture. It's kind of building on what Mario was saying in terms of revisiting the archive, expanding kind of the discipline to include maybe histories that are usually not covered within architectural histories at Western institutions. And I also uh, give a summer workshop, in which is uh, traveling to Beirut over the summer in the last few years. Um, I'd love to hear from a couple of professors around uh, where did you get your architectural educations and how does it differ or is similar to the education that students would receive here at GSAP and also why, are, why did you choose to teach here? Um, that's a great question to start us off. I did my Master of Architecture at Yale. Um, I was a non-architecture background, um, and there was a steep learning curve. Um, but I remember my first semester, a studio teacher emphasized that when you're coming from another life experience or another discipline, uh, you don't know what you can't do. And so it was uh, a really great cross-pollination, which is fitting that I am teaching core one uh, of the skill sets that the students with backgrounds had and then the ways of thinking um, that I come from a dance and pre-law background. So it was how to bring the analytical and the, and the creative together with architecture. Um, I teach here exactly for that reason that there doesn't seem to be a kind of cap on the ways that you can think about designing, relating to the world, even the ground. Um, and you just have to flush out your idea and make it believable and actually find out how to make it possible. So. It's a really great question. And I think we all were stumped for a bit because it, it's been a while since I've thought about this question. <laughs> but um, I did my undergraduate at MIT. It, it wasn't called architecture, but it was architecture. Um, bachelors, and then I did my graduate work at um, Harvard, and I would say that MIT was um, talking about what was architecture at that time. It was the same studios <laughs> that had been taught for a while, and um, at Harvard it was, this is architecture. And the reason why I love teaching here is that I think that there is a real generosity of approaches um, and an openness 
to looking within our architecture, looking um, to uh, our colleagues um, who um, are teaching slightly you know, different focus. Um, I find myself thinking after I go somewhere else on a review, thinking, I mean, the work was good, but it wasn't that fun. And I just think that we have more fun here. You know, I, I don't think that the, facu the faculty are serious, but the spirit of generosity and questioning and um, just the, the, the openness uh, of GSAP makes, particularly being a faculty member, you know, even being on another jury, just a lot more fun and enjoyable and less judgmental. I'll just be very brief. I, my, I did my master's at Princeton University. Probably share that with some others um, who teach at this institution, but which was an amazing educational experience. But what I will say is that um, you know Princeton is a relatively circumscribed and, and smaller school, and one of the incredibly, I think, valuable inherent qualities of GSAP is just the sort of amazing sort of biodiversity of approaches um, of faculty members, of ways of teaching, and and different modes of thinking about architecture. So I think um, in contrast to other schools, I think there is a, a scale and a density here that allows for the kind of emergence of kind of the unexpected in kind of extraordinary ways. Yeah, okay, yeah, all right, hi. <laughs> so I, I did my undergraduate at Berkeley and I, I just realized I might be except for Mario and I did our um, graduate work here at, uh, at GSAP uh, long ago. <laughs> um, and then I taught a lot of different places. So I've taught at Penn, I've taught at Yale, I've taught at Princeton, uh, RPI, and now I've been at Columbia for about 18, 18 years. And I, I really wanted to come back to Columbia. I, uh, it took a while <laughs> to um, to get back, and you know, and it's and it's interesting. Mario called all of our schools our sister schools, and and it's hard, right? So we realize everybody's trying to choose between all the schools, and I think every school has good things. Everything every school has good things about it. For me, why I really wanted to come back here actually is its larger size, and the fact that within a larger size of a school. Um, I could uh, they, they, uh, I could do a lot more things. So when you're in a smaller school, there's a smaller faculty and there's less, you know, of all the diversity of the things that you are exposed that you are exposed to. And I find, um, you know, not only that as a teacher that there's so many different kinds of teachers here, and but also the students and the students are looking for different things and they manage to kind of direct themselves on their own path, even though there's not a, um, a thesis, you, you, can, you, you really can tell the different strands of um, uh, pedagogical approaches and approaches to architecture that are at the school. And it really allows you to make those choices in terms of what classes you take. So I hope that helps. Yeah. Could I could, oh, offer a quick counterpoint? <laughs> I went to school at Berkeley, uh, but Laura was undergrad, I believe, when I was grad or close to that. Quick, quick point of reference. Um, first of all, it was an unbelievable experience to go there, but I always thought of it then and now of a far, far less constructed school. So there were amazing faculty, but you had to build the connections and you could, in fact, avoid them. Uh, so the school had lots of reasons for imagining why that was fruitful. For me, it was. But from a distance, and I think still today, I used to view Columbia as far more constructed. Mario, I think, showed some of that. But you saw Mario's diagram becoming a finer grain and then that kind of algorithm of mix. So that, I think, is absolutely accurate and quite true. I got in trouble when I came here, a fun trouble. Uh, I told the chair of another school uh, it was like teaching at a subway station. Uh, and uh, I meant that as positive. Uh, Toshiko Mori was chair at Harvard at the time. And uh, she told Bernard, Bernard Shumi came back to me, Michael, I hear you think it's like a subway station. And uh, I said, yes, in the Manhattan transcript sense of the word, in that the interchanges are really quick. And so it was never meant as derogatory. It was meant as a school that, in a New York sensibility, requires you to think fast. And there's perhaps less overt sympathy while you're doing that, but in the wood and in the grain of it all, there's an immense amount of sympathy. So you'll probably figure out how to choose a school that fits you. But the, I thought that 
granular diagram was a really good image of it. Yeah, thank you. Hi, um, good afternoon. Um, two specific questions for uh, Laura and um, Amina. I'll start with you, Amina. Um, just curious how like um, sort of the intersection of like analog and digital shows up in your work and some like, um, you know, like in your work outside of here as well as um, potentially like in your studio courses. And then um, for you, Laura, um, if uh, you guys like partner with like emerging technology, um, you know, sort of like emerging technology or like, um, you know, tech companies or whatnot um, to like sort of like integrate or explore um, sort of like new sensors or like types of um, readings and the work that you do within the computational design um, practice program. Do you want me to uh, start? Yeah. So um, a lot, just to say a lot of the work that I do actually is done in the school because I run the Center for Spatial Research and so and used to be the Spatial Information Design Lab. And um, I feel very lucky in that. It's just what I do. So I think there's a lot of practicing architects over here. I'm not, I'm not one of them. Um, and the work that I do is very exploratory within that realm that you're talking about, um, you know, the confusing spaces between the digital and the physical and how they mutually reinforce each other and also how they've changed so much over the last um, 20 years. Mm -hmm. So while I've been here, I've always been the director, uh, the coordinator of visual studies and have um, sort of curated a number of courses that go, that are open to students all across the school. Um, and for the MArch students, for the, you know, for the ones who can take electives. And it's followed sort of the history, you know, we were one of the first schools to have like an architecture. we had an architecture course. Um, right now we have a course um, about physical computation called MetaTool, where, you know, that whole idea of space being coded and very different kinds of physical interfaces, plus procedural urbanism, which is more smart city approaches and, you know, parametric urbanism and generative design, which is more about optimization or um, uh, data journalism, right, which you, uh, which you see a lot that architects actually get hired by news organizations because they, they tell stories so well about spatial um, histories and spatial futures, right? So all kinds of, um, all kinds of things. And so the, we're not here to talk about computational design practices program, but it's very open to all kinds of um, ideas about what practice might be. But it's the same here, I think, in the architecture school, although it's more constrained by um, accreditation, um, you know, and by what we need to know responsibly, right, and ethically as architects of the of the built environment. But again, right, the scale at which we were, we all work is very different and very open ended and. We all love to sort of talk across those ideas and mutually reinforce one another. So, oh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. I think um, my background in dance caused me to, when I came to architecture, realize at the very beginning there was a thread that I still work with today, which is that. I don't think of form as static. I think of form as dynamic and constantly changing. So architecture is just a still, a pause and a continuum of time. Um, so I bring that absolutely into my studio where uh, it makes sense. I kind of hold the computer back from the initial conception in that our, we live in a three-dimensional world with gravity we all have a body, so we are intimately aware of how we move through and uh, interact with other masses. And so I privilege the analog, um, and it's also hyper, like infinitely detailed and has all of the intelligence. Um, so a project that I did uh, teaching robots rhythm was Robot Double Dutch, um, taking the very basic, seemingly basic game that a four-year-old could play. Well, I couldn't play it at four, but th there's a lot of uh, intelligence. And to try to teach something seemingly so basic as a downbeat and an upbeat to a robot actually is more complicated. 
So I, I want to almost disrupt the way we think about the computer is more precise, but taking rhythm is one entry point to uh, showing that there's lots of different intelligence in our, our body. Um, and so I think of that as kinetic intelligence versus <laughs> artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Another question? Um, Lola, just, Lola just has something. Because you asked about collaborations with um, uh, practitioners and people maybe from the field, um, a lot of the building tech is about um, engaging in conversations with practitioners. So three of our core courses actually involve mentoring with um, practitioners from energy, water, transportation systems, and whereas uh, perhaps less related to uh, realms of t tangible and media design, um, those technologies, uh, those conversations with technologies um, help um, students in the tech sequence really develop their um, integrative systems in their, and support their design studios. Oh, hi, good afternoon. Are we good for another yes, question? Okay. So I asked, um, how would you describe your relationships to individual students, like our accessibility to you outside of class time, like with office hours, replying to emails, or even Zoom calls now? All, all of the above, <laughs> absolutely through you know office hours. Every all of us, I'm sure, um, have office hours for our courses. Um, WhatsApp is also a tool, a Slack, and um, you know through not only email, but um, this is a small building, and we um, continuously meet each other. And um, I personally also do a. a coffee hour um, once a semester to hear students' voices about the tech uh, sequence and how uh, their work is evolving. But anyone else? I, I will add to, just quickly to the coffee. That's a great question because that's what really matters in a way is, is how you gain access to all of this that's being um, discussed. Uh, I can say, for, so the, the history faculty teaches a little bit differently than in different formats than, than the, the design studio, obviously. We're not as, we teach basically two hours a week in the seminar, and rather than the kind of regular crits in which there's more direct contact. So we, we you know, we're in that sense, we are maybe more familiar to some of you, I don't know, individually um, a, a, in the way that we teach and interact with students from your undergraduate, if you've had uh, particularly a liberal arts education, but even if, if you've done architecture, we are the ones who teach the seminars. Um, and so probably the same practices that you're familiar with there would hold, would hold here. Uh, it's a big school, Laura mentioned this, and, and that's one of the strengths, I think. So in the QAH classes, for example, um, to pick up on the, on the coffee thing, uh, we don't do coffee, but, but, but I'm, there's 30 people in the class. So they're large seminars because they're introductory. Uh, and I'm just this week, scheduling outdoor meetings with groups of like three or four. If the weather permits, we have this wonderful office that we have here in front of the building and we can hang out. And uh, with smaller groups to, to, to kind of discuss um, the, the class and, and everything else that they're doing. So, so we uh, probably would say the cafe also is an incredible and back now, you know, back to life kind of place for, for encounters of various kinds. So, so in that regard, what is most urban about the school? Its size, its speed, its, its kind of you know, hustle bustle is also what in many ways is, is most intense and most immediate and maybe even most intimate. So, so that, that New York is a place where you meet people. It's not a place, just a place where people don't, don't know each other. That, that's that's the, the spirit. Yeah. Maybe one more question over here. Oh. Oh, here. Um, yeah, so I just have a little question about like the environment and the culture. So I realized that um, a lot of people I've met today really come from very different backgrounds of their studies in undergrad. 
And um, I just want to hear more about how, what are some more interesting cases or some really interesting cases about how their undergrad experience or their studies in the past or experience in the past kind of um, influenced them and how, I guess in a sense, like what you, like your experience and because things cross pollinate and sometimes you experience that, oh, I want to develop, develop this furthermore. We're developing this idea furthermore. How would you support that? And I just want to hear about some cross pollination stories about um, different fields. I, that I'll be very quick. Uh, I, the microphone seems so formal with this size. <laughs> yeah, which is not giving the best impression, maybe. Um, that's a great question. Um, there's so many standard answers to that, and I'm sure you can imagine them, like that it's, that it's all a net positive. Um, at the risk of seeming you know, too conclusive, a story that I'd heard when I was much younger was that when William Worcester was dean at MIT, somebody you've probably never heard of, but a very prominent dean who later founded the school at Berkeley, he divided urban planning and architecture. Urban planning was for policy and law. Architecture was for aesthetics, you can imagine, a long time ago. But I, I remember that quite vividly because I feel like for most of my life in architecture graduate schools, all of those terms have been highly blurred. And I often tell, discuss it when I taught undergrads was, you know, when I was an undergrad, we often talked about the owner and the user. And when I was a graduate school, we began to talk about the subject, you know, Michel Foucault, Derrida, critical philosophy. So in other words, we really had to deeply, deeply broaden who we imagined we were working with, for, or about. So that question about people that are from lots of different fields is utterly critical here. You made me think of a funny story. I had a PhD student, I had a student at a PhD in economics from Cambridge and a physics degree undergrad from Princeton. And we got along great, but, but that, was a, that was an extremely <laughs> diverse and interesting young man. Uh, Caltech offers physics and economics, so it's not unusual necessarily to put those together. But uh, everybody can answer that here. Our school has such a, such a range of people. I, I didn't know Amina had studied dance. Now I understand it'll work better. But uh, I think somebody like Amina in particular, or any of us, uh, this is, that's a wonderful question. Yeah, yeah. Or, or I'll just, I'll also add, and I know that we're running out of time, that, um, that our program, and I would say all of the programs, actually like to talk to people outside of the program. So in, for example, in our advanced studios, our Wednesday lectures are actually the opportunity that we have guests come to speak to us who are not within the discipline of architecture. Um, so uh, we had uh, Noam Siegel, who's a curator, come and talk about the Berlin Biennale last week. Um, the week before that, we had the artist um, Josiah McElhaney, or the month before that, come and speak to, to our students. Um, a number of us, in terms of the studios that we teach, also bring outside the discipline, if you will, um, guests. So my studio, along with Professor Mabel Wilson's studio, had um, just last week, uh, Jonathan Gonzalez, who's a choreographer, movement artist, conduct a movement workshop with our, with our studio. Um, so there are, I would say, a number of opportunities for cross-pollination, not only amongst the students, but also in terms of getting outside of you know, the, the boundaries of what we think, think of as architectural design or architectural education to have this dialogue with others. Just, sure. Yeah, just quickly, just I just saw uh, Patrice walk in. We had a student who's a neuroscience, uh, a neuroscience student. No, I, I was just saying, I just saw you, and I'm reminded of a joint real estate architecture student. And she went off, um, and she sort of specializes in um, you know, neuroscience and real estate development in a really interesting way. Or someone who came in with a with a, uh, public health and medical, but also went into architecture. Uh, now works. What's the famous place? Um, oh my God, hospital research hospital research hospital that does. Huh? 
Johns Hopkins, yeah, yeah, one of, one of those, you know. And there's people, but then there's people who come in with biology and then they just get really interested in computation and they become really great architects, you know. So there's so many, there's so many different models of starting someplace and, and ending someplace that you don't quite know what's going to happen with the background that you bring in. But we love it, you know, when students bring their backgrounds um, to the subject at hand because then the conversations are just so much more interesting, yeah? So I really, really hate to bring this to an end, but you guys have a pack today. Um, we want you to actually get some lunch before you start visiting studios and visiting mid-reviews. Um, I do want to alert you that we will be hosting an online Q&A on Wednesday at 11. Uh, the Zoom information will be, uh, will be on the, the school's website, um, and also, again, to invite you to move throughout the building this afternoon there. We are in our mid-review week, so the Advanced Studio 5s are having their uh, reviews all throughout the building today, so feel free to, uh, to visit uh, the reviews. And uh, again, if you have any questions, please, if you see any of us wearing these green tags, faculty, we'd like to meet you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, please come up and, and ask questions, and hopefully we'll also see you on Wednesday for the online Q&A. So thanks, thanks a lot. I'm sure I'll see you uh, upstairs.